to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Ebro, Laura Rosenberg. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Amanda Seals, ladies Hi. and gentlemen. Hi. This is my first time here. Yes, <laughs> it is. Well, not really. Crazy. I mean, you've been to the station a thousand times over the years. Over the years. Over the many years. But I've never been on the show with y'all. Well, well thank you for coming up. And uh, Amanda Seals is back on tour, y'all. We outside with post-pandemic. How's that going for you? It's so nice because when you are in the house during the panini, you're only dealing with the internets. And the internets are not like a true representation of like actual... I love this. Right. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's not a true representation. It's of... not real life, people. <laughs> it is and it's not. Like it's real internet, but it's not real life. Well, how about this? The energy you receive in the comments oh. is not the energy you about to get when you see people on the street or you meet people. It's Yo. all love. It's all love. It's all love outside. Yo! I was on the street yesterday. You know, I was walking. I had to go find some flats because I made the error of, like, forgetting. You in New York, like, you can't wear heels <laughs> for longer than a block. It's yeah. over. So we were, like, in the street. And the amount of just, yo, I love you. Egg yeah, big fan. <laughs> like, <laughs> and what I love about New York, too, is that people just uh, show you love on the move. That's like, right. nobody's oh, got, the best. nobody has right. time. Right. To talk to you. A little no. drive by, what up? <laughs> yeah. yeah well, in know. LA, there's, it's a stop and chat. In New York, they oh, keep it moving. And a photo, <laughs> and a convo, <laughs> and a business card mm -hmm. exchange, oh, yeah. and what's your IG, mm -hmm. and follow me. How can we, what, what can we, you know, I want to nah, work on some not things New York, together. Not New York. What People, up? Yeah. Love you. Boom. <laughs> Driving my truck. Got work to do. Got kids to feed. See, <laughs> yes, I'll yes, watch yes. a special, maybe even come to your show. <laughs> yeah. So, the, I mean, when I was doing shows in Brooklyn a few years ago, I would take the train because it makes sense. And as a New Yorker, we do what makes sense, mm -hmm. okay? So I would take the train, and people would be on the train with me to my show. And even then would be like, yo, on the way to the show, I fucks with you, and go back to what they were doing. That's right, right, right. right. <laughs> not trying to, we're stuck on this train. They're not trying to talk to me. It sounds like you miss New York. That, is that the impression I'm giving? Yes. I apologize for giving that impression. You don't. <laughs> I do You not. do not miss New York. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no, I do not. I respect, I regard, I love New York, right. but I do not want to live here. Got it. I don't have the bone density at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the stress uh, level. Like, I can't. It's nice. It's like having kids. Like, it's, and not having kids. It's right. nice to be like, oh, look at your kid and give it back. Right. That's New York. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and you lived mostly, when you lived here, you lived in Brooklyn, I believe, or Manhattan? Harlem. 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 And a, a lot of people don't uh, or may not remember the Amanda Diva part of your book. So that's the thing. Book, I've lived journey. in L.A. long enough now where there, I have a whole life of people that right. are true friends that don't know anything about that time. That's crazy. It's and like I like went in my own witness friends. protection. Yeah. <laughs> they're like my actual real like friends. Like they know you. Yes. And if someone showed up and was like, Diva, they'd think it was weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, and it's happened. That, I've, I've, ha I've experienced that in real time where someone walks up like, Dave, and they're like, what's happening? <laughs> right. Steve. Who is that? Right. So yeah, yeah. Before, be before everyone saw you on TV and doing comedy and on social media, you were an aspiring artist for a long time. You put in, how long was your grind in hip hop? 10 years. Yeah. I mean, I was hosting. And I, I was going to say MTV. Yeah, I was doing hosting on MTV. I tried to get a job here. I was doing serious uh, satellite radio for four years. I was rapping. Uh, I was singing. I put out like solo independent projects yep, yep. and mixtapes and uh, DJing. DJing. Um, yeah, you did it all. I mean, you really did. Listen, I, I have uh, spray can tops for when I was aspiring to do yeah. graph. Like I was stepping yeah. in. Amanda, yeah. Amanda, you were the person that like one of like now you would run into who comes up to you and is like, "Yo, I, I DJ, I rap, I produce, <laughs> I do poetry, I host." I mean, Yo, you're like, "All right, I choose found something." A business card. <laughs> I found a business card that says Amanda Seals, rapper, poet, spoken word, like actress. And I was like, "You dumb idiot!" Like. <laughs> Do something. You know what, though? So to that end, though, that's how I ended up in stand-up. Because it was like, choose something. I knew that I was done with music. Like, I had... Because music was done with me. Right. Like, hip-hop had gone on a different journey. And I was like, oh, this doesn't feel... Like, like what I want, what I want to be a part, of. A part yeah. of anymore, and so and Green Green Lantern had like very much been on my head about changing my name, and finally I was like, it feels 
right. Like, because now I'm changing my lane, too. So it feels right. And um, I was looking at, like, people's careers that had it, that had made careers that I wanted, where they had, like, made a multimedia moguldom out of their point of view. So it was, like, Chelsea Handler and Chris Rock and Ellen, I remember looking at. And all of them had books and had... Uh, TV shows and had movies, but they also had live shows. And I was like, you know what? This is the one thing that all of them do that I don't do, stand up. Mm. Mm. But I was trying to like figure out my next turn in my career. And it was like, like Rosenberg said, like I had all these things I could do, but it seemed like I do nothing. So were you in New York at this time when you were trying? Yeah. So did you start going through the, you know, the comedy circuit? Yeah. Like the so cellar basically and like that. I... I like had this notion in my mind and I manifested like someone hit me up like a few months later it was when SNL was looking for like a negress and people <laughs> people were doing these like stand up uh, showcases and this girl hit me and was like, hey, you know, we're doing a stand up showcase. We'd love to have you. She thought I already did stand up because I was on B. Uh, v I was on VH1 Best Week Ever right. with all these other comics. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. Yes, yeah, that, 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 yeah. that, yeah. yeah. that, hey, yo, that was funny though. Yeah. That was a funny show. You know what? The comedy about that show is uh, that I almost didn't get picked for that show uh, because I had gotten broken up that morning. I was seeing Pusha T. We were dating and he we, he had broken up with me that morning. <laughs> and Damn. I went to the show and I, I remember I was wearing a shirt that said, I'm the catch. <laughs> <laughs> to try and make myself feel better. But shout out to Terrence. That's my nigga today. <laughs> this, to this day, that's my boy. Shout out to Virginia. They have a beautiful child. And um, I was like trying to suit myself up. But the whole interview, I'm just like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's tough. And I'm trying to like really be on my shit. And then after the interview, I knew I bombed. Like they're asking me shit to be funny. I don't, got, I don't care. I don't got it today, I don't got it. And so <laughs> tear dangling. Like, oh. <laughs> and so like on the way out, we like somehow randomly start talking about like Barack, I think. And I guess in my, I was riffing with them. Now that I didn't have the pressure of the camera on me, like we were just chit chatting. And they told me later I got the job on my way out. Wow. Wow. Good for you though. So that's a lesson, y'all. It ain't over till it's over. over. <laughs> was that, was that, um, where is that like in the order of things that like, little breaks you got before your big break? Um, where does that one sit? Was Best Week oh, ever six. a big one? Best Week ever. Um, you know what? In hindsight, I guess it was a big one because even though they were paying me 225 cents, um, <laughs> the, it was the proximity I had to other funny people that were professionally yep. funny that ended up eventually pushing me in that direction. Right. Cause Mulaney, John Mulaney was on there at that time, like Nick Kroll and Sherrod Small. Like that's a great group. Exactly. And then I'm in there. You know, because I had a good conversation about Barack on the way out. <laughs> like, but that proximity, I think, even you pointing out what you were being paid is a good learning lesson for people who are watching. The way you watched other and, and kind of saw what other people were doing that were women and having success, right? In comedy mm -hmm. and writing and everything. Somebody's watching you right now, mm -hmm. right? And wondering how many times you took a job that paid zero dollars Right. Just so you could be in proximity or get the reps or create a relationship or get a get a look on a resume. How many times did that happen for you where you had to take things literally where it was like, I don't want this, but it's going to get me to another thing. You know what it is? It's not even that I don't want this because I feel like for so for me, there's like three tent poles. And I talk about this in my book, Small Doses, also available on Audible and paper paper well paperback. Done. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I talk about like. For me, there's the content, the money, and the people. Two of those things have to be in place for it to make sense. Mm. So sometimes the money isn't making sense, but the people and the content make sense, so right. it's still worth it. You know what I mean? And then sometimes the people are trash, but them dollars is talking. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you so, feel good about the content. And you feel good about the right. content. So yeah. you're like, you know what? They're not determining like my output, you know? So let me make this make sense. But I feel like what it really is is you have to have the vision and the vision has to be bigger than the moment. And sometimes people forget that. And so they just live in the moment and the moment can give you a huge paycheck, but not serve your vision. And so then you're going to end up broke anyway. Right. Mm. And the moment can also, like you said, pay you nothing. As I remember red alert telling me one time, like, you know, sometimes you got, I can't even do it yet. That was more Mike Tyson than red alert, but <laughs> sometimes you got to work for free to get paid later. 
Right. And I think that's a concept that a lot of people are definitely bucking up against at this point right now. Like the younger generation is definitely not hearing that. Mm. And it, it's a place where I'm not going to lie to you. It makes me feel like a conservative when when I see like <laughs> when I see other people out there saying that I feel like the old man who's like, nah, you think in entertainment you just get to show up and get paid. What makes you good? Why do you think you deserve to get paid yet? It's it makes so me true. feel old it's and washed a, it, that I and feel you're that way, out but on I do. So many opportunities to be but present. But the other side is knowing your value and yes. knowing why they want you in the room and yes. why they're even inviting you in the first right. place and making sure that if you're providing content that is of value and they're going to monetize true. and you're paying other people, how but come in, I Amanda, in Amanda's well, case, if, if look at Amanda when you were on Best Week Ever. Amanda, if she had said, hey, if this is based on hard work and how smart I am, et cetera, et cetera, I should be paid. But in reality, you were still getting your feet wet. Yeah. Right. You're still a novice. Like, at the end of the day, there's a difference between, like, knowledge and wisdom. Right? And so, like, that's the other thing, too, is, like, you may have the skills, but you don't have the instincts yet. And so that's a lot of times what I see when I work with interns. We have a Smart, Funny, and Black internship program. And, you know, we, we don't pay our interns, but we make sure that we get them networking opportunities and they are able to do master classes with folks in their field. And we present their work and we really try our best to make sure that, like, they feel... They're not just getting coffee and getting dry cleaning and absolutely right. not. feeding your They're dog. expanding their, pl their, right. pl their uh, portfolios, et cetera. And we've hired an intern from each intern class every year, right? So... For me, I feel I feel like there was a certain level of that that I was interning, right? And I look back on it, and I'm appreciative of the the fact that I also knew when to leave. Mm. <laughs> That's the other part, right? Knowing when it's like, oh, okay, it's time, it's time to make space for other things. But that was um, that was like a really uh, important learning curve. And eventually, with stand up, I just realized like. I need to stick with this. Like I did the first set that that chick had invited me to and I didn't bomb. And, you know, you can see the first set. It's on YouTube. And I was like, oh, okay, this is actually fun. And I stuck with it. And from the very beginning, I respected that this is a whole new field. You know, I remember Saif was, you know, doing yeah. stand-up at that time. But he too, like he didn't come in like, y'all hear me on Hot 97, put me on. You know, it was like, nah, like this is a different space. I need to understand the etiquette. Mm. I need to understand the hierarchy. I need to understand the rules of the game. I need to be humble, right? And it doesn't mean that you need to be humbled, but it's like just modesty. You know, it's really what it is, is knowing to when to shut up <laughs> to like receive. And I, I feel like I advanced faster because I came in in that way. And also because I knew my voice by the time I got to stand up. So... Once I started doing stand up, it um it really re I realized quickly like oh I'm home. Mm. So that you had you re that yeah. was the moment you found this is my place this is where I'm yeah home. because this is me. because I had continuously been told two things one oh you do a bunch of things that's like you do nothing well once you do stand up it's like well you host right I mean you can you can write right you produce right you can you can, sing. You can, you act, can act right you like can, yeah. so now all of these things that people were like counting me out for they're like well they expect you to be able right. to yeah, do right these. it's counted as part of your <laughs> your resume yes like this is a part of the job description so I was like oh this is amazing and very quickly you can make people understand what you're about immediately I can just say I'm a comic and they're like oh they have a context for that they also have a respect for it yeah, you yeah, know yeah. so it cuts a lot of things short and then it was also I had always been told that I was mean, you know, that I was hostile, that I was aggressive. Once I was with other comics, I was like, oh, no, I was These just are my a people. comic. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so how was your first stand-up experience? And was it in New York? It was in New York. Yeah, okay. I was at the, on the 8s or something, like in Williamsburg. And I was on my way there, and I was nervous, but I had my set ready, and I, I was going to do five minutes, and I was on my way there, and... In perfect New York fashion, someone decided to kill themselves in front of the oh, L train. God. Um, damn it. You know, damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Selfish. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? This is an omen. I should go home now. And so I get out of the train. Uh, I was transferring to the L. So I get out of the train. I'm standing on the corner, like trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And this white girl walks up to me and is like, are you going to Williamsburg? And I was like, yeah. She's like, do you want to share a fucking cab? <laughs> 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 like I'm in a movie and I was like uh, yeah she's like yeah because this is like so crazy yeah. and I was like alright <laughs> so we get in the cab it was like right after Halloween 
And so she was like, I wasn't, at this, she was like telling me about this Halloween party she went to and the costumes. And it was the year that everyone was doing this Trayvon Martin blackface BS. Huh? And um, what was this year? I missed this. This is 2013. Like there was a lot of like people dressing up with like a hoodie and Skittles as a costume in blackface. Like it was really pre just really pretentious and ridiculous and just disgusting. And I mentioned it to her because we were talking about costumes and she was like, what's blackface? So then I explained blackface to her and she was like, that's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> But she was genuinely appalled by it. Right. Like, but it also was, of course, like, how can you not know what this is? But of course you don't right. know what Living this is. Living in a bubble, white privilege. That's exactly. what it is. Yeah. And so when I got to the show, I just threw out all my material and just talked about this cab ride for my set. And like I came up with some jokes, like some tags on on it about just like blackface, et cetera. And it ended up going over. And that to this day is essentially how I come up with material. I don't write. Live life. I live life. I don't write things down. I just go off top. Really? Yeah. I'm like, has, has it ever backfired? <laughs> You're like the whole <laughs> of comedy. <laughs> One take. <laughs> like, have you ever been on stage like, oh, that didn't work out? Every comic has been on stage like, because, <laughs> and you know what? Every time that's happened, it's because I tried to write. Because I was like, oh, I'm going to write this. And then I'm like, this is very funny. And then I get on stage and they're like, it's absolutely not funny. This is <laughs> very boring and corny. And But now you haven't completely bombed yet, though, as that happened, where the whole set was washed because you just lost the audience and it unraveled. I can think of one time. I've never been booed. Um, but, I mean, I can think of one very specific time at the New York Comedy Club where I was like, oh, so y'all just not going to laugh? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, man, fuck y'all. And that's the only time it's ever like gotten me. But I definitely was like, I'm out. You know, you kick the stool, the stool fuck over. Fuck <laughs> You don't deserve me. Um, but no, now, at do this you have point. The, uh, Amanda, do you have the obligatory, um, obligatory black comedian dance for one minute intro every time you become? <laughs> no. Yo, DJ, play my song. <laughs> Yo, oh. You know what? I was about to say no, and then I just remembered that I came on stage. I had two sold out shows at the Hollywood Improv the other night, and they play. I asked them to play "We Gonna Make It," and I definitely See, danced. You did. <laughs> See Rosenberg and Rosenberg, you talking about obligatory black comedian? Black comedians can actually get up there and dance. It's the white comedians well, that's why that can they literally do not connect with their audience with music. But you know what <laughs> happens is the music catches you. That's right. That's what happens. Like you get I on know, stage. Because you're black. You, yes. You're black. You get no, on stage. Rosenberg literally... doesn't have this experience. He doesn't no, know No, that's this. precisely. I actually fully process it that way. It's just always <laughs> funny. Because every time I'm at a show, I'm like, they're always surprised that they're feeling the music. But I'm like, every time you were going to feel that no, song. No, I didn't. You know why? And let me tell you why I did it. Because I don't go to the club. Uh. I have not been in the club in a long time. I haven't heard music at a loud volume. Volume like that. So you heard we gonna make it. You was with the but you do it. Hold up, we gon' make it. I'm doing the, I'm doing the dance. <laughs> like, no, that's just like, So now with the comedy, we've had a number of co comedians on in the last couple of years and talked about this whole notion of cancel culture, mm -hmm. and and comedians feeling like they have to draw a line about cancel culture, and it's a, in a lot of people's stand ups. I don't believe in cancel culture. What do you mean? I don't believe that people are actually, unless their whole existence is in social media. Like, literally, you got kicked off of a platform. Or, literally, you went to prison because you committed a crime and you were convicted of said crime. Are you actually getting canceled if you can still go on tour and you can still sell tickets and you can still put out your content? Does it actually still exist? It feels like much ado about nothing, essentially. Well, I think... <laughs> thank you, Shakespeare. Um... <laughs> I think the term cancel, I think the word cancel is a misnomer for what it actually is doing. There you okay. Go. Right? So it's not actually like canceling you in terms of like your existence, but it is canceling your time for a little bit. And it is actually like slowing down the paper. Yes. And it slows down your mental health too. Okay. Like I've, I've been quote unquote canceled before and it, with it, it really, really it feels like a voodoo doll like you feel like you're being pricked like um because what were you canceled for quote unquote canceled for uh, so many things uh, <laughs> what's but the it, first one mostly... what's the first trauma that hits your heart when you hear it uh, i would say the first trauma that hits my heart when i hear it is when i 
had been told by a number of women that an individual was problematic and it felt like if I didn't say something on my platform that mm. I was being complicit. Mm. Um, and there was, and I had been shown empirical proof and I had like done back check and like, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and it was taken out of context and then it was like headlines were made that were not correct to what I had said. And then uh, a man uh, literally made up a false headline that has haunted me to this day. Wow. And he said that I admitted to lying. Uh, his headline was Amanda Seals admits to lying about sexual harassment from this person. And one, I had never accused this person of sexual harassing me. I had never lied about this person wow. sexual harassing me. And I had never admitted to lying about sexual this person sexual. That then dovetailed into people saying you lied about this person raping you whoa oh my god which then turned into amanda seals hates black men wow. so all of these things happened as a result of me feeling like i need to do my best to be protective and it to, i'm literally to this day like at least once a week someone says like oh don't you uh, don't you remember? Don't you owe this person an apology? And it's like, I, no, I don't. Then that person did like a press conference and lied. Like it was just a whole. It's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot, lot, and it was. And it's real. It's very real, and you get death threats. Well, so <laughs> and but so on that, like I get death threats every day, so probably weird. right. I get, but it's all social media based, right? Or yes. somebody says something. But you're loose. also a big man. Well, yeah, but that part, <laughs> I, and I was about. That's exactly where I was about to go. <laughs> and also, though, at where you are today where you aren't just go like you have your own tour you have your own platforms you have your own things where let's hypothetically move those instances of what you're describing to us to today would you do you still feel like you'd be able to go out and do your tour and have your platform and create your own never narrative and have more control over what's being said today well but let me tell you you know this happened at the height of my like blossoming this happened simultaneously with my special coming out in 2019 wow so that was the other mind like fuck was like and that's oh, a special that me and my lady love so much and that we watch all the time yes i be know on love hbo that. i love, love that. that you love we it love that. we love that <laughs> so and by the way and i missed all of what you're talking about <laughs> no god i got you i'll come back um it's so weird it's so weird that you missed that because i was in it i remember right. collapsing on my living room floor in just despair because it, it had like cycled up again because a gossip blog decided they needed some clicks. Right. And they like added another layer to it. And then I started getting the death threats again. Ugh. And Sam J, shout out to my homegirl Sam J, her show Sam J Paws, second season on HBO. Sam J was at my house and had to physically lift me off the ground and be like, She's Fuck amazing. These people! She's amazing, by the way. <laughs> That's Sam my J dog. Amazing, yeah. And she was like, nah, son. Nah, son. Fuck, the, fuck all that. Fuck <laughs> like, all that. And um, you know, like I I'm somebody who I always get frustrated at like the how often I get misunderstood because my intention may not necessarily have been the best at, I may not have presented something the best way to relay my actual intention and then you know things go haywire but that was like one of those moments where you're like okay I guess I'm being canceled like because 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 all I care about is like does this black audience want to see my shit and mm. it feels like it's not necessarily real but it feels like in those moments that everybody in the world is coming for your soul right mm -hmm. and they want you to die like in a real way right now with the real i'm getting all these messages what's, from, what's the real because the real left me out of their final their final episode even though i was a host on the show right and i don't need them to do a tribute but like it would have been it would have made sense that I would have so been. So there's least all been... this pile on in your comments oh about whatever. You wasn't nothing on the show. You didn't add nothing to the show. Who do you think you? And I'm I'm being generous with the language right now. <laughs> and how long were you on the show? I was on the show for six months. Okay, that was that's a, a good amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> I was on it's the show part. for six months in a pandemic, like. Waking up 4.30 a.m., you know what I'm saying? Like, I contributed significantly to this space. But, you know, for what it's worth, uh, we live in a wonky time where, like, people don't know what's real, what's not. Like, we things are blurred. Lines are blurred. Like, it's... Oh, it's, it's alternative facts. It's... I was a little bit about to say, like, we came up with a new word for... I didn't know. Don't say that. Not they, we. Not we. They came up with a new yeah. word for lying. <laughs> like, Pretty much. 
it's it's yeah. beyond my scope of comprehension. Uh, literally, me and Charlamagne talk about this all the time. We're just like the fact that like adults just be lying. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> blows our minds. That's right. Like because that's not something I employ. Like I make mistakes. I may. Say I mean, of course, of course, Charlamagne has done that many times about people personally as well. Just want to say that. But I hear you. You're right. So we talk about the <laughs> fact that that's something that like is not normal. Like the way that it is normalized. That's how now. I felt when he lied about me. That's how I felt. I refuse exactly. to turn this. This is so white of you. I refuse no, no, no. to turn this. No, no, no. It's actually so Amanda of me. We are the exact same, I and you would do the exact same thing. I refuse to turn this interview same into your thing. interview. <laughs> if I, if you, if I was on your show and I said that, you would just do what I did. It's okay. Continue on, though. I continue. I would not do that. No. No. Maybe so if someone lied on you, if someone lied on you and then someone else brought up that they love truth, you wouldn't, and I'm not blaming you for it, Amanda, it's your friend, do whatever you want. I'm just not going to let it go by on this show without pointing out he's done the but, same but thing. But this is about Amanda, That's though, is point. her point. It's about Amanda, <laughs> not about that instance. <laughs> okay. That's all she's saying. <laughs> Another Keep... reference, I wouldn't have said anything, but continue. Keep going. <sighs> As I was saying... <laughs> Uh, Sorry. No, you're not. But as I was saying, um, you know, and by the way, let me just say this. If you have all that, y'all need to talk. We need to all grow up. I tried. And we, try again. We need to all grow up and try have again. conversations gonna... because the truth is, is like everyone is advancing and elevating. There was a time when I did not rock with Ebro. Really? Yes. Right. Because you had come at me wild sideways and I did not like it and I didn't have like the space to let you know that and then eventually uh, the fact that you just said really is like you forgot but we had a whole conversation about this well you said something guys. you said something to me about it and it, i never remembered what you were I know, referencing but, but then so, you were like if i did say that but i didn't I know I didn't, I didn't know that it was a long time I, I didn't know that it was like over an extended i didn't know that so, well it was a long time for me like if that's you, right right, right. That's like fair. it was happening you know, for you, like it was just something you said, and but like it, it landed on me right, and like stuck right. with me, right? And by the way, Amanda, you're right. It probably is similar. I'm guessing the thing that I get tight about, Charlemagne barely even remembers. So you're right. There's always room for conversation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like people move on and are like, that wasn't a big deal, and you're like, well, it was a big deal to me. To me, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So I feel you. It I was a you. big deal to me. Like I've even we've had to learn that in my relationship. You know that like things hit different people different ways, and you're like, oh, I didn't know that. That bothered you? Right. And then the curiosity is the compassion. Well, why did that bother you? Right? right? And you like go. so many of us are afraid to to even go there because then we may find out in that moment that we was trash. Right. <laughs> and we're all capable. <laughs> we are all capable. You know? Like yeah. I've had to find out in real time, like, oh, I was, oh, okay, I was inadvertently trash. But now that I know, I can know better and do better. But inadvertently well, it's kinda, trash. It's kind of like what you just did, Rosenberg, and you apologize for it. Whether, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You were inadvertently trash. And I think there's also the, there's also the truth. Of it the happens fact, a lot. There's also the truth and reality that, like, especially as us as entertainers, like, we are in different spaces that call for different things at different times, and it seems like True. it's the right thing, and it seems like this is mm, how facts. I need to show up in this space, and then yes. you get you mature or you get you're out like, of what that. What was I doing? You're, you're like, like why? What? Why was that the hill I had to die on? <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, and that's the grace that cancel culture doesn't give you. Right. I love how you brought that back around. Wow, you brought that really around full circle. <laughs> well, and it's also, it, I think, that, like you started, cancel culture as a term is a misnomer. It's a misnomer. But it's very real, and the pressure and the mental issue, mental health kind of pressures and those issues it presents is real. And there's, well, real, also, and Amanda, there's, there's also so further many... repercussions. Like, you know, like when Kevin Hart didn't do the Oscars, right? Like, it, there's levels to mm. how things can affect you and how you can, and the choices you're forced to make. Right. So that's such a great example, though, Amanda. Like, Kevin, for example, he's a perfect example of did something in a silly way when he was young that was stupid, ill-advised, whatever, m tried to make amends for it, still got quote-unquote, and in this case really did somewhat get canceled for it. Yeah. But then you have on the flip side, it's called the exact same thing, someone who gets up, tries to antagonize a certain group, then the group gets mad, and they're like, oh, my God, don't cancel me. Those are two, like, wildly different things that get called the same thing. Yes. I mean, I've ultimately... It, it basically, if you said something saying, offensive about a group, yes. and they right. get I, mad okay, at you, yes, 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 and yes. you're like, oh, I'm not even allowed to say offensive things to that no, group anymore. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> well, that to me is the misnomer because it's exactly what you're saying. No, you're not. And there's an accountability that should be taken and saying like, 
well, maybe I I didn't mean to do that. But then if you did mean to do that. But you planned it. <laughs> like you literally scripted it and planned it. And now you're mad that people are mad at you. Well, there's that. Right. So that's the other thing. The narcissism of this nation has so embedded that like people are mad when people are mad at them. And like you can give them a legitimate reason. I am mad at you because of this, 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 this. And then people say to you like, who do you think you, you are? are? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> like, I think I'm somebody who's telling you why you hurt my um, feelings. <laughs> right. You hurt my feelings. And that is embedded in this society, by the way. That I mean, is the, the is, infrastructure. That that's what the guns are about. Yes. I'm not gonna talk to you about it. I'm gonna shoot my way out of it. I have a I have a bit in my in my stand up. Come out to the Amanda Seals Black Outside Again tour. Go to AmandaSeals.com for dates. But I have a bit in there where I talk about like how a homeboy of mine uh, it, is is a pharmaceutical entrepreneur, <laughs> and uh, he found himself in a situation where he didn't have his strap. And he was being approached by a group of dudes. And he was telling his boy, like, do you have a strap? And his boy was like, I don't got the strap. <laughs> he was like, I don't got the strap either. <laughs> and he was like, I had to, I, I didn't have what I needed to protect myself. All I had was my emotions. <laughs> and, and I was like, what did you do with your emotions? And he was like, I just turned around. I said, yo, I feel uncomfortable right now. <laughs> <laughs> yo, that's a bar. And <laughs> he said the dudes was like, Stopped in their tracks. They didn't, didn't know, know what how to deal with this. <laughs> and they was like, well, we are comfortable too. <laughs> and, you know, you got to come to the show to hear how the story yeah, ends. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but it's really like there's this thing that people don't know how to deal with things. So it's right. easier to just erase. You know, it's easier to just do away with things. And I, I, I'm, I'm really working as a human to be so much better about like showing up in a real way and – the work part. The work. And knowing what that means. Not just saying that as a nomer, right? right? Like, the work. People are like, the work, the work. That can mean the electric slide for all I know to some people. Because I'm like, do you really know what the they, work One, well, a lot of people don't. They don't. And they, and they expect... Uh, the world to tell them how to work or where to work or where to find It's like where. white people asking for a book list. Right. Like, what am I, how am I supposed to learn? How am I supposed to learn about racism? It's like uh, Google, your phone. Uh, a lot you had of options. some great videos around that time, Amanda, about talking about white people. I don't got the time people. of on my trampoline. That <laughs> right, was exactly. a direct response to an agent that I had, who had called me and was like, "Um, so tomorrow, you know, we're all taking the day off to respect black people." <laughs> Wow. Oh my God! <laughs> like, That's keep going. And, I want to go ahead. <laughs> and she was like, you know, so, um, you know, during my day of observance, I would love for you, to, you know, if you could just give me some books that I can read. And I was like, so I should still be in service. Um, <laughs> right <laughs> on your day. On your day of, of service, I'm supposed us, to I work for you. <laughs> Got it. Cool, cool, cool. And she was like, um, Amanda, I'm not trying to offend you. And I was like, well, you weren't trying to offend me, but you did. And I was like, because let me tell you something. Um, you've been working with me for two years and you have a number of black clients. And you're telling me now that you need books to understand racism. And you are a Jewish woman. And I know all about your Holocaust. I know all about Rosh Hashanah. I know all about your culture. And it's because I've been curious enough to care. And you're a part of my society. And I could sing the dreidel song right now. Oh, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. Bam. I made it out of clay. <laughs> I was like, Like, get out of here. We're trying to act like this is so foreign to you. Right. Like when, you can't pay attention to other people. That's background. all I'm saying. And right. she was like, well, I just feel like you're not being fair. And I was like, <laughs> of course, that's how you feel, because that's what you're going to deflect with. But the truth of the matter is you should have already been doing this work. And now you're trying to get me to work for you to do your work. And I don't got the time. I'm on my trampoline. And, <laughs> and not only that, but my ancestors work is why you have the privilege you have in that's the first it. place. That's it. That's it. But we, it's just having the, the curiosity. You know, that's the other thing about America. Like, you got to think about it. When you go to other countries, the news don't look like our news. That's right. Our news is just about us. Every other country, it's they're going to the talk about the world. And I just know that so many of us want better for this place and better for ourselves and we can't and it's like how 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 and my one of my things is i've always believed education is the number one way the fact that they worked and continue to work so hard to keep us uneducated lets you know the same way that people are like our vote doesn't matter it's like if they if our vote didn't matter they, they would not work, work this hard. hard absolutely like no, the absolutely. effort that's being put in place to keep your vote from mattering and i'm not saying it's all that matters 
Because that's the other thing. I'm not sitting here talking about, like, all you got to do is vote and we're going to fix this. No, that's a multi-pronged, you know, uh, revolution that has to happen. And on this tour and in my stand-up, I speak to that. I want my stand-up to be more than just jokes. You know, I want my comedy to be the comedy of record for this time that uh, is, you know, I want my comedy to come from the tradition of George Carlin and Dick Gregory and Paul Mooney. Like, that's how I, that's where I come from in this work. It's by any joke necessary. Like, that's the bottom line for it. So, like, when you come to an Amanda Seal show, I'm going to tell you now, like, you're going to get wittiness more than silliness. Right. I'm silly. Don't get it twisted. But, but no, nah, we're not doing all that all the time. Not all. We, we don't have time. That's right. We don't have time to do that all the time. But we have time to fight for our joy the same way we got to fight the power. And we laugh to keep from crying sometimes. All the time. Listen, we wear the mask that grins and lies. So it, it deserve, we deserve to actually laugh for real. And like Smart, Funny, and Black is also featured on this tour. So like I'll be in D.C. for two nights. I have a residency at the Kennedy Center. And we do Congrats. Smart, Funny, and... Thank you. We do Smart, wow. Funny, and Black the first night. Smart, Funny, and Black is my variety game show where we bring two funny people on stage and test their knowledge of black culture, black history, and the black experience in games that I've created. And we've been doing this since 2016. Yo, and the games that Amanda created you gotta be on your game, baby. <laughs> Amanda's Columbia University, NYU. Like she got a degree in this, fam. But it's thank you. Uh, <laughs> but it's actually SUNY Purchase. I did not go to NYU. Anyone who went oh, to NYU sorry. is gonna be like, she did not. Sorry, go sorry, to, she sorry, did sorry, not sorry. wear the purple robe. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry. But it's like I created it because we see so much negative imagery. We need a celebration space. We need a like actual, authentic space of black joy. You come to a Smart, Funny, and Black show, that's what you're going to get. You can come if you're an ally, you know, but you need to be a co-conspirator. And <laughs> not just like, oh, yeah, like, I don't believe in lynching. It's like, right. that's not enough. And <laughs> you need to know your place. When you come to a Smart, Funny, and Black show, it, it, understand this is a place that is welcome to everyone, but it is for black people. That's right. So you are at a barbecue. OK, right. <laughs> and you need to respect that. Like, I don't walk into spaces that are not our spaces expecting us. You know, uh, like I was always so surprised when the Will Smith scenario happened at the Oscars and people were like, white people shouldn't get to talk about this. And I'm like, you did it in the whitest <laughs> place ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> national television. It's and literally super called white. Oscars I... so white. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I was like, I don't really feel like that's you know a practical application but i'm just i'm just trying to at this point in my life like it's dress rehearsal is over like we are in full purpose mode at this point go time go time i had covid i got over it you only had one i've only had it one i, I had, had it two, two weeks times. ago I, oh, you just the first time? Yo, I oh, was out wow. here, dude. Yo, yo, you yo. thought it was all good. I, I, I you thought, thought it was all good. I thought I was gonna get a. We'd like to get a sample of your blood uh, to create an antidote. <laughs> like, I really thought I was about to be you a part of a study. The cure. <laughs> yes, and both my, my mom gave it to me and my man, and I tell the whole story on stage. But it, we really thought like this is gonna be light. You know what I'm saying? We late in the game, laid up. Uh. Lay how long up 10 days yep. 10 days worse, I watched... than, worse than anything you ever had or in there with a the flu and all that because you know there's so many different versions of it too right like people get so it many was... different versions I've never been that tired in my life I watched every episode of our prehistoric earth um <laughs> Shout out to Apple TV. Great show. Yo, for a wow. second, did you think the dinosaurs... You were like, yo, they shot some dinosaurs. Son. Yo, there's dinosaurs like, out here. This is dinosaurs, yo. I really... And, you know, you have this COVID haze. Yeah. You're like, You're like yo. maybe they found the dinosaurs. You know what? But, like, I, the nerd in me was just so fascinated. I, there was, like, these feathers on the dinosaurs. This is wild. But it's just... um. <laughs> It's just, it's, it's a new time. It's a scary time. You know, shout out to Atlanta. Atlanta has had so many losses. Yeah, man. Um, Tough time in Atlanta. And they're going through a lot of, I was just talking to some people the other day about, you know, how our country destabilizes black and poor spaces often like this because they want to be get that proximity. They want that real estate. They want to take over city council down there. So they start selling all this scariness to mm. get people to vote emotionally. Right, because now what happens when people go to the voting polls soon come, right? They start voting against their self interest in favor of pushing black folks out, pushing poor people out. Next thing you know, Atlanta may not look like the Atlanta you know. 
Well, Real people fast. have been telling me that, you know, and it's shout to Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor again. Right. And, and you know, they want to keep that state red. And who, and, and who, which county helped deliver the current presidency we have? Atlanta, Fulton County. Right. Atlanta. I, I, we, Same we, thing in We Philly. don't know about the other places that are currently not Atlanta, but because I, I was like, oh, Decatur's not Atlanta. OK, so <laughs> that was a lesson for me. But I just I really am scared for the complacency that people are still exhibiting around mm. what is happening to this nation and the fact that the long game that's been employed is being carried out like in a real way. Facts. And I feel like when you asked in the beginning, what is the difference with going on the road than the internet is that I feel like when you're actually on the ground and in front of physical people, the conversations that you're having are a lot more grounded than the internet, like cray cray things that people are just spewing. emo chaos <laughs> just, just yeah you know just throwing shit out there right and when people speak to you in person there's a, just a lot more willingness to have a conversation versus to just throw something at you and expect you to just be okay with receiving it that's all the weird thing about this internet people are like why aren't you okay with being disrespected on a daily basis <laughs> like why isn't that that's like what we do here amanda <laughs> don't you know twitter that's what we do i log on twitter just to get into some disrespect i already You're know so what's going funny. on i already know what we're I, doing I today take a step back from twitter because i was like y'all mean this feels twitter's like seventh mean. grade no twitter's Definitely. mean this feels Eber like seventh will fight grade. with just eggs oh i'll fight with it's it's good it's good it's it's reps. No, you you're right though. It's it is reps. reps. You know what though? When you're when you're expected to have opinions and clapbacks, like you do need to you need get practice. in your kung fu. It's practice. true. Ladies but and I gentlemen, <laughs> uh, this is Amanda Seals. <laughs> AmandaSeals.com. I'm glad you finally came to our program. I had Congratulations fun. on everything you have going on and Thank whatever you. you need. You can count on us, man. Appreciate you. Amanda. Amanda Seals, give it up. Go yeah. look for her, man. She's back outside. Yeah.